It was February 20, 1959, Black Friday. In a single morning, Canada erased its most ambitious aviation project, one that could have changed the balance of power during the Cold War. Five prototype jets destroyed. Blueprints burned. Thousands of dreams gone in a flash. This is the story of the Avro Aero CF-105, the jet that almost changed history. The Aero wasn't just a plane. It was a symbol, a statement that a small nation could innovate at the very edge of technology. It represented the hopes of thousands of engineers, technicians, and pilots who poured years of work, expertise, and ambition into a single aircraft. And yet, in one swift, shocking decision, it was wiped from existence. Its legacy, however, would not be forgotten. Its story is a lesson in ambition, politics, and the fragile nature of technological progress. Imagine standing in the hangar at Malton, Ontario in 1957. The gleaming white fuselage, delta wings stretching nearly 50 feet, and nose pointed to the sky. This was Canada's answer to the nuclear age. It was fast, it was deadly, and it was, in many ways, the last word in Cold War interceptor design. But before we dive into the story of the Avro Arrow, make sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on that notification bell. It's 1953. The Cold War is at its peak. Nuclear tension dominates every political, military, and scientific decision. Soviet long-range bombers, armed with atomic weapons, could reach North American cities within hours. Canada's own interceptor, the CF-100 Canuck, is a subsonic fighter. Reliable? Yes, but far too slow to intercept these high-speed threats. Military planners imagine the Tu-16 Badger and the Tu-95 Bear flying silently over the Arctic, heading straight for Toronto, Ottawa, or Montreal. Canada's geography made it the front line for the defense of the continent. So the government turns to Avro Canada with an almost impossible challenge. Build the fastest, highest flying, most advanced interceptor ever conceived. Engineers face challenges that push the limits of mid-20th century technology. The Aero needed to reach speeds of Mach 2, altitudes above 50,000 feet, and operate reliably in the harshest Arctic conditions. Its avionics were revolutionary. Advanced radar systems for bomber detection, electronic flight control systems that were a precursor to modern fly-by-wire, and weapons integration designed to engage multiple targets at extreme ranges. Every component had to work perfectly. One failure at those speeds could mean disaster. This wasn't just about speed, it was about survival. Canada wasn't just building a plane, was building a sword capable of defending an entire continent. The political stakes were enormous. A failure wouldn't just be technical, it would be national. Yet the engineers at Avro were undaunted. They were driven by national pride and a vision of Canadian ingenuity that could stand on the global stage. October 4, 1957, the arrows rolled out in Malton, Ontario. A gleaming white prototype, RL-201, is revealed to a crowd of more than 12,000 spectators. Dignitaries, engineers, and journalists look on as the future of Canadian aviation takes its first public breath. Its design is radical. A 77-foot fuselage, needle-nosed and sleek, delta wings spanning 50 feet, twin Pratt & Whitney J-75 engines capable of Mach 2, nearly 1,300 miles per hour, service ceiling 53,000 feet. The Aero's contemporaries make for an interesting comparison. The American F-106 Delta Dart, a leading interceptor of the era, achieved Mach 1.8. The French Mirage 3 could reach Mach 2.1. The Soviet MiG-21, a lightweight but deadly fighter, topped out at Mach 2.05. The Aero could match or exceed these designs in almost every metric with superior radar and avionics integration. And it wasn't just speed. Its delta wing allowed for exceptional high-altitude stability. Its climb rate meant that it could intercept bombers quickly. Its fly-by-wire-style electronic controls gave pilots precise handling even at extreme speeds. On March 25, 1958, test pilot Janusz Zurakowski takes RL-201 into the air. From the moment it leaves the runway, the aero impresses. Even with the early Pratt & Whitney engines, it reaches Mach 1.9 by its seventh flight. Engineers predict that with the planned Orenda Iroquois engines, Mach 2.5 is achievable. The Iroquois engines were themselves marvels of Canadian engineering. 
over 25,000 pounds of thrust each, capable of sustaining the Arrow's weight and payload at extreme speeds. The Arrow isn't just a plane, it's a flying weapon system. Its radar is integrated with a missile guidance system, allowing it to detect, lock on, and destroy bombers before they can reach their targets. Pilots describe it as a dream aircraft, stable, responsive, and agile despite its size. Its rollout coincides with Sputnik's launch, highlighting a stark irony. While the Arrow is a triumph of aviation, the age of ballistic missiles is dawning. Yet for bombers still in service, the Arrow remains a critical defense. As the Arrow soars, the world changes. October 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik. Suddenly, the focus shifts from bombers to ICBMs. Some strategists argue the Arrow is obsolete, a high-speed interceptor built for an earlier era of aerial warfare. Costs escalate. By 1958, the Arrow consumes over 12% of Canada's defense budget. Each jet costs $12 million, over $100 million in today's dollars. The U.S. pressures Canada to purchase American Bomark surface-to-air missiles instead, cheaper, unmanned, and part of an integrated North American defense. Parliament debates, editorials clash, the nation is divided. Yet advocates insist bombers still matter. ICBMs are expensive, limited and detectable only after launch. Bombers can evade radar, adapt flight paths, and deliver devastating payloads. A fast interceptor remains vital to continental defense. Canada faces a dilemma. Continue a world-class aerospace program or conform to the American defense strategy. Meanwhile, NATO allies express interest. France, Britain, and even some Middle Eastern nations consider aero purchases. Canada could have become an aerospace export powerhouse, competing with Lockheed, Boeing, and Dassault. Politically, however, the aero success is a liability. It demonstrates Canadian independence, technical mastery, and global relevance, something a neighbor may find uncomfortable. February 20, 1959, Black Friday. Prime Minister John Diefenbaker announces the Arrow's immediate cancellation. 14,528 Avro employees are unemployed overnight. The order is absolute. Destroy all prototypes, tooling, and blueprints. Workers watch in disbelief as gleaming aircraft are cut apart with torches. Blueprints, painstakingly created over years, are burned. Technical manuals, production jigs, and specialized tooling are shredded or melted down. The official reason? prevents secrets from falling into foreign hands. Unofficially, it ensures the arrow can never rise again. The destruction is methodical, almost ritualistic, erasing nearly a decade of Canadian aerospace innovation in a matter of months. The arrow becomes a symbol of what might have been, a testament to ambition cut short by political and strategic pressures. The human cost is profound. Top engineers, designers, and technicians suddenly find themselves without work. NASA sees an opportunity. Jim Chamberlain, Avro's chief technical designer, joins the Gemini program. Owen Maynard, lead designer at Avro, becomes a key engineer for the Apollo Lunar Module. Canadian expertise, which nearly touched the edges of the atmosphere with the Arrow, now helps humanity reach the moon. In essence, Canada's loss becomes America's gain. The Arrow's legacy continues, not in Canadian skies, but in the stars. It's an ironic twist. The brain power that could have defended North America instead propels space exploration and lunar landings. The Aero Mark II with the Arenda Iroquois engines was projected to reach Mach 2.5 and 60,000 feet, could have outpaced the F-4 Phantom, challenged the F-106 Delta Dart, and even approached the F-15 Eagle years before either entered service. The Aero could have redefined global interceptor standards. Allies wanted it. Export sales could have made Canada a dominant aerospace power. Instead, the dream dies on the factory floor. The Aero is more than a plane. It's a symbol of lost opportunity, a reminder of the fragile interplay between innovation, politics, and strategy. Canada could have led in aerospace technology, but the program's abrupt end diverted talent, money, and ambition elsewhere. Today, Canada flies American jets. The Avro Aero exists only in photographs, museum exhibits, and in the imagination of what could have been. Its story is a cautionary tale of ambition, politics, and lost potential. If this story captivated you, subscribe and click the bell. We explore history's most compelling what-ifs, uncovering stories of innovation, 
ambition, and dreams that nearly changed the world.